All right, gang, today we're going to talk about the long-term and short-term effects of the French Revolution. Um, the French Revolution had a tremendous impact, not only in France, but also in the world as a whole. Uh, what you'll notice and what we're going to talk about is how a, or rather, what a dramatic impact it had on the world as a whole. So what are the immediate impacts? Well, first of all, in France, the immediate effects were obviously the end of Louis XVI and his wife, and the monarchy. As we talked about today, uh, Louis was beheaded, and that marked the beginning of the reign of terror. Um, when Robespierre was beheaded, uh, that marked the end of the reign of terror. But it still was the end of the monarchy. The monar monarchy in France was dead um, and was completely over. The French Revolution sort of ended. I won't say officially ended, but officially didn't end until 1815 when Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo. Um, but for all intents and purposes, the, the immediate effect of the French Revolution, and it ended in 1899, or 1799 when Napoleon, with Napoleon's coup d'etat over the directory and his control or taking of power. Um, so that's an, an immediate result of the French Revolution. And so what we're going to see here is that now Napoleon's in control in France. Uh, he begins to push through an order, a regime of change, and order a regime that is based on ability, not birth, and that's a significant difference from obviously the old France um, that was based on class and privilege, but now we see ability based on birth, um, and we're going to watch a video on Napoleon today that will really illustrate that, or I'm sorry, tomorrow, Tuesday, that will really illustrate that, and what a, a, a man he was, and, and how he really um, gives us an example of ability over birthright. Um, well, how did it affect the old world? Well, in the old world, that's Europe, um, the rest of Europe really got scared, to be quite honest with you. Um, the other countries in Europe, right here I've got restoring the old regime written down. Um, the other countries in Europe became very paranoid, and they were deathly afraid of this. And their immediately, immediate goal was to put the monarchy back in power in France. Napoleon scared them. Not only did Napoleon scare them because he wanted to conquer their lands and export the, the, um, the revolution, but because he threatened everything they, they knew about their life. They, he threatened a complete and total upheaval of their society, and they, they did not want that. Um, so that was the effect on the old world. Um, and so they began to wage war against Napoleon. And as we're going to see when we talk about the resettlement of of Europe and how everything works out in the end in just a few minutes. Um, that's their number one goal. How did it affect the world? Well, the French Revolution, like the American Revolution, had a tremendous impact on the world. The way I want you to see this is a continuous string, uh, string of events from the American Revo the Enlightenment to the American Revolution philosophically to the French Revolution. And then from the French Revolution, those ideals of the Enlightenment then got exported to the New World. Um, French colonies and Spanish colonies in the New World began to demand their independence. Uh, Portuguese colonies began to demand their independence from, from their mother countries. The, the thing we need to know about this, though, is that one of the things that enabled them to gain their independence was that the mother countries had to return their focus to European affairs. Uh, France could not worry about the, its possessions in the New World. Napoleon had to focus on waging war in Europe and expanding his power and control in Europe rather than putting down slave revolts in the New World. Uh, two significant um, revolts were by Toussaint L'Ouverture um, in Haiti. Um, he leads the Haitian slaves in, um, on the Dominican uh, there, and he leads them to revolt against their French masters, and he leads that successful revolt. And so we'll talk more about him in the next World Unit we'll do. And then in South America, a guy named Simone Bolivar. Simone Bolivar is really important. He is the George Washington of South America. And so what he does is not only does he lead um, against French colonies, obviously, uh, but he also leads against Spanish colonies. And he is largely responsible for the gaining Latin America or South American independence. And at one point, in one time, he had a vision of a United States of South America, just like we've got the United States of America. He wanted to join all of South America into a union of states, much like we have. Obviously, that hasn't worked out, um, but that was his vision. So let's talk more about the old regime in France following um, Napoleon's conquest and Napoleon's taking power. Well, 
as you're going to see in the video, um, the French Empire itself, the land directly controlled by France, greatly expands. So I'm going to pull up a uh, some ink here, and I'm going to show you guys. Um, under Napoleon, France physically controls the Netherlands, much of Italy, including Rome, which is significant because he now takes control from the church, um, but also this western part here of Italy as well, and what become known as the Illyrian, or what are known as the Illyrian provinces. These are, this is land that is under direct French control. It's part of the French Empire. Um, countries that are in direct control, or indirect control, rather, of Napoleon are Spain. He establishes, I believe, his brother is in charge of Spain. Um, the Kingdom of Italy, he sets up kingdoms of Italy and Naples here. Uh, he sets up with puppet governments. Puppet governments basically means he controls them like the little puppet master, and they do what he wants. Um, and then lastly but not leastly is the Confederation of the Rhine, which are um, a loose union of the, the German states. And, and they owe their allegiance to him. And they are, again, yet another puppet government of Napoleon. And then lastly but not leastly, we've got the Grand Duchy of Warsaw, uh, which it, for all intents and purposes is Poland um, for us today. And these other countries here in purple you see are those aligned with, with Napoleon. Basically right now these countries are scared of Napoleon. So they have said, we are going to align ourselves with you, and we are going to, to set up and, and, and be with you, even though we don't really like you. And we're going to see that in just a minute. Because the old ancient regime's empires that were here, um, they are constantly fighting against Napoleon. Uh, they are actually waging war against him, even though temporarily they have been defeated as of 1810. All except for Great Britain here. Um, all except for Great Britain who continues to wage war against Napoleon and his empire. All right, so <clears throat> what we're going to have here is now a meeting called the Congress of Vienna. Vienna, you, do not, you guys do not have uh, notes on this right now, and so you're going to get those. Uh, you're going to have to take notes on this on your own. But here's the number one problem. If you go back to the map, uh, Europe is in disarray. Napoleon is defeated at the Battle of Waterloo for the second time in 15 in 1815. He's kicked out of Europe completely um, and is isolated on an island um, in the South Atlantic and can no longer um, get out. Um, and so he's, he's trapped there. Uh, but the problem is you have all of these old kings, you have all of these old uh, monarchs who want their power back, one. Uh, two, you've got people who now have been given power and so they really demand uh, that they keep the power, and so you've got to find a balance to that. And so the European states all get together at what's called the Congress of Vienna. So the main problem is you have a complete upheaval of society, uh, you have complete upheaval of politics, and you've got to hammer that out and figure it out. The main players here are this. Um, you've got Prince von Metternich. Clemens von Metternich is from Austria. He is the Secretary of State, or head of, uh, not head of state, but Secretary of State for the um, Austrian Empire. And he's going to play a major role. Uh, this guy, Castlereagh, is from Great Britain. Uh, he helped lead the British against and defeat Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, he is from Great Britain. The other major player is Tsar Alexander I of Russia. He is another of a long line of Romanovs um, who comes in and helps to settle. Was defeated by Napoleon, but thanks to the long Russian winners, they were able to, to bounce him back. Prince von Hardenberg is from Prussia. Uh, for what I want you to think about, it's Prussia equals Germany. Prince von Hardenberg is from Prussia, um, and I'll show you that on the map in just a second. And lastly, but not leastly, is Charles Talleyrand from France. Charles Talleyrand was part of the government in, in exile. Um, he hung out in Austria as protected uh, by the Austrian government. Um, and Talleyrand, uh, what he wants to do is he wants to reestablish um, the French monarchy and, and reestablish them. So here's the plan. Here's their mass plan. One, what I want you to think about is what do those all have in common? These names here, Viscount Castlereagh, Tsar Alexander, Prince von Hardenberg, with the exception of Charles Talleyrand, all of these guys are nobility. And that is important to note because that means they are the ones the nobility seeks to regain power. And so the three goals of Clemens von Metternich at the Congress of Vienna are this. One, peace. Bring peace, back, peace and stability back to Europe. Europe had been in a state of almost constant war from 1890, or I'm sorry, 1790 until 1815. 
So we're talking 25 years of almost constant war against France. France constantly seeking to expand its wealth and its, and its empire, and so now they want to contain that. Three, they want to restore the balance of power. They do not want France to be the dominant power in Europe again. Uh, so they want to restore what's known as the balance of power, uh, the states being roughly equally peaceful, uh, or I'm sorry, roughly equally powerful, and no one state getting too large and out of control. That changes, obviously, in the 20th century. And they also want to restore legitimacy to rule. Uh, legitimacy, in their eyes, was they want to restore the rightful governors, the rightful rulers of government, uh, back to their seats. But they also have to be mindful and weary uh, to also take into account the rights of the people as well. So how did it break out? How did it look in the end? Well, here's what um, the map looks like. Uh, we've got England. Great Britain doesn't change. Okay, Spain is once again thrust back into a monarchy. France's borders were not taken from them, but what we do notice is that their expansion was halted um, and the borders are back to where they were. Um, new countries that were created, um, the German Confederation are these countries outlined here. This is not a unified Germany, and that's important to note, and that's something we're going to get into the next unit. But these are nations that, for all intents and purposes, are German. Uh, they speak German as their base language, um, and so those are important to us. Um, Hanover, Bavaria, Saxony. Uh, the Austrian Empire grows. The Austrian Empire picks up the, the Illyrian provinces here. Um, you'll notice here that Italy is divided up and not one central government any longer, um, nor was it before. It's more back to what it was prior to the French Revolution. Uh, you've got the kingdoms of Sweden and Norway is all one. And then also you notice that Prussia is a country that is relatively new and emerges. And we're going to talk more about that um, much later. Uh, Prussia, by the way, existed prior to the French Revolution. Uh, Prussia is one that you don't hear or talk much about. But again, Prussia equals Germany. And so we're going to look at Europe following the Congress later um, in our next unit, in, in another unit in 19th century European politics. But what I want you to understand is that the map of Europe is redrawn, redrawn to restore balance of power to make peace and to restore legitimacy, that's restore the nobility to power in Europe following Napoleon's reign. Goodbye.